This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. The wide open spaces of the American West loom large in our country's mythology. But that romantic narrative has always left something out. You know, the virgin wilderness, a place that was uh, unpeopled, where um, only animals roamed. But the reality of that is that Native people have always inhabited these spaces. One percenters have contributed generously to preserve America's wilderness, going back to the founding of our national park system. But leveraging wealth and privilege for access to nature glosses over the human cost. The idea of giving your time and philanthropy um, to protect nature is through this elite sort of white lens that can be based on you know, this romanticized view of nature. And for example, for Yellowstone, had to remove certain people um, to create that Eden. How much is access to so-called wilderness tied to wealth? Climate One's empowering conversations feature all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the exciting and the scary, people who are in power and people who are disempowered. Today, revisiting the idea of billionaire wilderness, up next on Climate One. For many of us, the story of the American wilderness begins when Europeans arrived on these shores and began conquering it. What often gets written out is the history and culture of those native societies who were here to begin with and whose relationships to the land is very different. Because when you see the natural world and all the things in it as relations, as relatives, then you are then responsible to them. Dina Gilio Whitaker is a lecturer of American Indian Studies at California State University, San Marcos land that once belonged to indigenous peoples has been carved up and parceled out, some of it in preserves like national parks. For some people, being at one with nature could mean flying there in a private jet. In Justin Frail's book, Billionaire Wilderness, the Yale professor describes wealthy landowners in expensive cowboy boots swaggering through the saloons of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and congratulating each other on their environmental stewardship and philanthropy. And the money, most of it is going to environmental and arts organizations who have you know tens of millions of dollars in the coffers meanwhile the people who you know work for um, the wealthy who are there to enjoy this idea of nature um, are struggling working two to three jobs for some access to the outdoors is becoming a luxury not a right a hundred million people in this country and that's 28 million kids do not have a park close to home do not have a green space close to home that they can access we're actually about closing that gap. That's Diane Regas, president and CEO of the Trust for Public Land. On today's program, we'll talk about the history of the American outdoors, the intersection between public and private land interests, and how to make experiencing nature more sustainable and inclusive for all. We start by exploring the myths and realities of the American West. As Dina Gillia Whitaker points out, there's more to the story than most of us have heard or care to remember. We uh, often hear this phrase that the national parks are America's greatest idea or something to that effect. And this narrative begins with this sort of um, common sense understanding about the wilderness as, as uh, a, you know, the virgin wilderness, a place that was uh, unpeopled. It was uh, uh, these places where um, only animals roamed. And, you know, maybe there were Indians there at one time, um, but they were like the animals and they're roaming around on the, on the, the land, you know, aimlessly. But the reality of that is that Native people have always inhabited these spaces everywhere. Every square inch of the land on this continent was indigenous territory. They were spaces and lands that Native people used for a variety of um, purposes. They were, uh, most tribal people were actually farmers. Um, so, you know, to debunk the myth of the, the wandering nomadic Native, this is largely something that's very um, not really true. Um, there were people, however, that were, you could say, um, migratory. And they traveled between, between homelands, between places in what we sometimes call the seasonal round. So there were, home, much like people today have, uh, you know, winter homes and summer homes, um, Native people had, had the same kind of land use patterns where they would travel from uh, their winter homes to their summer homes and back, depending on food sources. 
and ceremonial cycles and things like that. So um, this is and this is what happens with um, some of these state are these national parks like Yellowstone, like like Yosemite and Glacier National Monument, which are the first three that become um, national parks. Um, and they, you know, the, the actual history of them is that they were not empty spaces that needed to be preserved, but they were empty spaces that needed to first be uh, created, um, as Mark David Spence notes in his, um, this, his infamous book, um, Dispossessing Wilderness. And, uh, and so, so this is, uh, you know, part of the larger history of, of American um, genocide, land theft, and, and indigenous dispossession that most people don't really connect with when they think of national parks. Uh, Justin Farrell, as a native of Wyoming, you note in your book that you gained access as a white man from the Ivy League that, you know, a person from another background wouldn't have. So you know, how did r- race and class offer you access into the ultra wealthy in Jackson Hole? You write about uh, the real upper percent there. Yeah. So historically, you know, there hasn't been a lot of work um, within the academy on the ultra wealthy, on economic elites, at least from the ground level, um, from their perspective through interviews or observation. And so um, in terms of this project, I really played up um, kind of both aspects of my identity. I I do talk about in the introduction of my book how I am a white man. I, I was able to navigate these spaces almost in an unquestioned way um, through these private clubs. If I were even walking through the lobby, you know, of um, the Yellowstone club or or some other um, elite private clubs, no one was going to stop me and ask me what I was doing there or ask me why I was there. And so I had that um, an aspect of, of my identity that allowed me to, to gain access into these spaces, but also um, being, you know, born in Wyoming. uh, I also have this, gravitas that um, the folks I interviewed often admired and tried to emulate. And um, so I had this kind of dual identity of this, you know, Yale elite um, gravitas and then the Wyoming Western gravitas that ties into these myths of, of authenticity and, and masculinity and, and um, was able to kind of pair those together to, to get the interviews and to get into these spaces. Diane Regas, for generations, the Astoria Hot Springs and Jackson were a community gathering area. In the 1990s, they were closed to the public and a developer planned to convert it to a private spa. What happened next? Well, what happened was the community didn't like that plan. Um, And in fact, a couple of those developers went bankrupt. And the Trust for Public Land believes that everybody needs access to the outdoors um, at every economic level every race, uh, Native people, everybody. Um, We can live longer, healthier, and happier lives if we have access. So the Astoria Hot Springs, which is about halfway between Jackson Hole and uh, Alpine, a city where a lot of the people who work in Jackson live, um, we figured out who owned it and tracked them down and began to engage the community in what would they like to see at Astoria Hot Springs. And what people wanted was a restoration of a place that they'd had access to as kids. Um, And people who'd immigrated to the area, a lot of the Hispanics who lived lived around there, live in Alpine, really wanted a place that they could go and recreate with their families. So we had thousands of local people involved in designing what Astoria Hot Springs could look like going forward. Um, It's one of the only hot springs in the country that is now run by a nonprofit, and we're hoping to reopen it. Uh, It'll be ready physically this year um, with uh, provisions to make sure that everybody can have access. So I'm really excited about it and really excited to get to go see it. And Justin, that really runs against kind of the theme of what you've written about, which is these private enclaves, gated communities, large vasts of land sort of uh, preserved for uh, uh, people who own them or their friends. Um, So where is the wealth coming from and how is it reshaping the American West? Yeah, it's it's coming from the shift within the United States and even globally with the increase of of wealth among a select few. And so, for example, we've seen a globally a 13% increase just over one year in the number of ultra wealthy people. And in in the United States, there are more than 100,000 ultra wealthy people now. And 
um, you know, that's commonly known in terms of just the, the wealth concentration and the income inequality that has resulted. Um, but it is nice to hear a story like the story of Hot Springs that you have this, you know, community collaboration and you have a nonprofit, um, you know, getting in touch with the community and building it around their needs, which is very different than, you know, our north in, in Jackson Hole, um, which was the topic of my book. Right. And, and and you write about how the wealthy relate to the environment. And there's also you, you talk about right uh, somewhat about uh, the people who live there who are very, um, you know, making twenty thousand dollars a year. And the, and these wealthy people like to pride themselves that they can sit at the cowboy bar and people don't know that they're a billionaire. and They f- mingle with regular folk. But what, what's their approach to the environment and the intersection of race? Yeah. So I talk about, you know, how they use the environment to solve these dilemmas that they face. And there's these economic dilemmas. You've, you've made all this money. Um, how, do you, how should you enjoy it? How should you give it away? Um, but then there's also the social dilemma, which you're kind of touching on here in terms of how do they wrestle with and respond to the social stigma of being rich, of, of um, feeling like perhaps they're not authentic people or perhaps for some feeling guilty about having all that wealth. Not all, uh, just some. Um, and that plays into how their attraction to these areas and to the idea that, again, kind of going back to Dina's point, that this is an, an unpreserved, a preserved Eden, you know, that they, they can enjoy, they can relax and they deserve, you know, to relax in because they've worked so hard to get their wealth. And so what's really interesting is the way it plays out, again, across these race and class lines, in the sense that, you know, when you move to a place like that, um, I write in the book how they're trying to become more authentic people and they're trying to resolve uh, these ex- existential dilemmas they face as wealthy, as folks who are sometimes targeted um, in the media and the like. Um, and so they try to form relationships with, quote unquote, normal people. And um, oftentimes those relationships are based on economic exchange. So, um, you know, I did interviews with the working poor, mostly immigrants from Mexico and ask them, are these really your friends? Do they really care for you? Um, what is your sense of how their environmental ethic and, and how they you know, enjoy the environment? And so all this is wrapped up again in race and class and impacts how they see the natural environment. And then it ultimately impacts their philanthropy and, and which organizations they, they um, give money to and, and the impact that has on the community and the ecosystem. Diane Regas, uh, the Trust for Public Land, you know, works with uh, community groups and acquires land that hands, hands them over to local control. Um, do you think that, you know, Native Americans, other people of color uh, traditionally have been left out a lot of those conversations? What does Trust for Public Land try to in- be inclusive um, with the people who are around the land now? And as, as Dina mentioned earlier, may have been related to it or, or occupied it earlier. Well, it takes time and care to make sure that we engage the communities. And so we we put equity at the center because equity in the outdoors is absolutely essential and it's not easy to achieve, I think, for some of the reasons that Justin has pointed to. So we look, is the the organization invited into the community? Um, Have we looked at the data and are informed about who's in the community, how to engage them? And are we involving them? Um, and it's really exciting to to me to see how when when we invite in a genuine way the opportunities for communities to engage uh, with us, with partners, for what they want to see in their community for the outdoors, um, it, it's truly transformational. It changes the community, strengthens the community, in addition to providing wonderful opportunities for people to get outdoors. Um, just one example that um, here in California, where both Dina and I are, are right now, the Kashaya band of the Pomo Indians had been uh, kicked off of their historic lands and limited to a very small reservation. And some of their sacred lands, um, they actually had to get permission to go, whether it was to uh, do traditional food gathering, whether it was to sacred ceremonies. It's along the coast of Sonoma, which you probably have heard of as a pretty wealthy area. Um, Some of the families that had owned that land allowed uh, the Kashaya to come on, uh, but they had to ask. And so a few years ago, we got the opportunity to work with the tribe um, and help them create a new Kashaya uh, preserve along the coast. 
so that for the first time they have ownership and management of that land, first time in 150 years since they were kicked off the land. For me, it creates a sense of optimism that we can make progress in addressing the very serious issues that communities have with historic inequities, historic lack of access, historic um, changes in even their access to their most sacred places. Dina Julia Whitaker, um, I realized preparing for this program how ignorant I am of um, Native American history. And I went to some pretty good schools, but and I don't know if I blocked it out of my mind because I didn't want to, it was hard to confront uh, those things. So, you know, address the educational inadequacies and also what terms we should be using. Your experience is unfortunately just common. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. You could have, uh, you know, a, 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 an advanced degree and still not know. Um, you know, the, the, what the actual history and, and political structure of this country is relative to American Indians, um, because it's not taught. Um, and, you know, studies actually show that, that across the board uh, in all 50 states in the K through 12 level, um, the teaching of American Indians stops at about 1900. So um, what that does in effect is render Native people as um, people of the past, people that no longer exist. Um, and so it's no wonder that when we show, if, if we do show up in popular culture or in uh, you know, demographic studies and things like that, um, most of the time we're not there, for, especially. Um, but when we are, we are painted with these broad brushstrokes of um, being, you know, not modern people, you know, relegated into this frozen past. So, um, but, but the important thing to know is that as, as people, we are not eth ethnic minorities, right? That's probably the biggest misnomer that we deal with. We are not ethnic minorities. It is not correct to think of us in terms of um, people of color, um, as uh, people part of the large brown mass, like um, we are nations. We are people with political relationships to the state because of the treaty relationships. There are over 300 treaties that are still extant, that still um, that are still in force because they don't expire. They are made in perpetuity, and that constructs our relationship to the United States which is usually a thorn in the side of the state um, because for them, for the American government, we have always been a problem. The Indian problem is something to, to be solved, which they try to do by usually by trying to get rid of us in one way or another. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton, and we're talking about wealth and wilderness in America. We discussed this idea of indigenous erasure with Dina Gillia Whitaker last summer. She's a lecturer in American Indian Studies and author of As Long as Grass Grows, The Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. After Joe Biden was elected president, he tapped New Mexico Congresswoman Deb Holland as the first indigenous secretary of the Department of the Interior. She's also the first indigenous cabinet secretary of any department. We invited Dina Julia Whitaker back onto the show to discuss Holland's appointment and what that could mean for our public lands. It's certainly, you know, a, a very, it's very significant that uh, we have a presidential administration that is going above and beyond any other administration from from what it looks like to me to uh, incorporate uh, or to prioritize native issues and land protection and things like environmental justice. Um, they really are uh, embedding the ethics and values of environmental justice at every uh, level of government, um, from what I've seen. So, um, and and I think Deb Halland understands all of that. I think she brings that to the office, and uh, and so I think she's an amazing choice for um, for the Biden Harris administration to lead the D Department of the Interior. What about Deb Holland in particular will change the relationship between the U.S. government and tribal governments when it comes to oil drilling, coal mining, and other extractive acts? 
Well, I think that remains to be seen. I think um, she she is really coming from the right place. She's an indigenous woman. She is not somebody like uh, we had before, Tara Sweeney, who was an indigenous woman from Alaska, but who is deeply beholden to the oil and gas industry. So um, Deb Haaland is not Tara Sweeney. Uh, just because a Native person can be in an office doesn't mean their their values line up with indigenous values. And we can see that in people like Tom Cole and uh, Mark Wayne Mullen, who are the representative, you know, congressional reps from Oklahoma, who are both Republicans, who are both deeply in the pockets of oil and gas. Uh, so, you know, just being indigenous does not mean that somebody has, you know, abides by those worldviews and those values. And those are indigenous, those are indigenous legislators you just mentioned? Yes, yes. Yes. Tom Cole and Mark Wayne Mullen are both members of the Cherokee Nation uh, and they are Oklahomans. Um, but they're very conservative and they often work, you know, against Native interests. Yeah, well, no group is a monolith, right? Uh, how might having a Native American as Secretary of the Interior change access to public lands, particularly for things like gathering materials for religious and cultural ceremonies? Um, again, I think that remains to be seen, but it but it bodes well. I you know I think that uh, she she understands the protection of sacred sites. She takes it really seriously. The idea of wilderness as an unpeopled place ignores the reality of the Native peoples who lived on the land for thousands of years. How much hope do you have that having a Native American at the head of interior will change the public perception of whose lands, not just the national parks, but really the whole country, we are actually on? So I think Deb Haaland's appointment comes at a time, there's a, a moment, there's sort of an opening right now. There's, this is, um, you know, we don't know how long it will, it will be, but, you know, the, the Dems have the mic right now of the national narrative. And, uh, and there's, so she, so she's the Secretary of the Interior, but at the same time, there's this larger land back movement that's happening, um, and even a water back movement. So I think that's something that we're going to be hearing more about because, um, as these activists say, like you can't have land back without water back. Like so, these things are uh, tied together. But the land back movement um, has been building for some time, and um, there's a lot of ways that we can talk about what that means, um, but. but but in its most fundamental sense, it means that doing justice, environmental justice for Native people and justice in general, uh, how, how it is that we think about what that means, cannot have off the table giving land back. Um, and that's something that's actually happened. Um, even under the Trump administration, the Trump administration gave, it returned, to my knowledge, at least 40,000 acres of, of public lands to tribes. The The train has sort of left the station. And I think there's uh, there's more of more willingness and acceptance to 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 think about what it means to to return uh, public lands to native peoples or to to trust status of native peoples and and in other different ways um, that ensures indigenous juris jurisdiction and land management practices. So there's a lot of coalescing of these issues coming together and that create this opening. And part of that is the the recognition that indigenous land management practices are key to climate adaptation and restoring the health of lands everywhere. Dina Julia Whitaker is an American Indian studies expert and author of As Long as Grass Grows, the Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. As we end, I just want to ask you, how did you feel when you heard Jennifer Lopez saying, this land is your land at the Biden-Harris inauguration? I didn't hear it because I can't listen to that song. I hate that song. Every American Indian person that I know hates that song. That song is a slap in the face to Native people. Um, even though, you know, Woody Guthrie, who, who wrote the song, um, was coming from a, a, a place of, you know, he was a progressive, he was a lefty, he was, uh, you know, he was very conscious of, of racial and social justice. But 
but there was a blind spot, right? He had his blind spot and that blind spot, he really didn't think it through. Like when he said, this land is your land, this land is my land. He did not. And he knew native people. He understood, um, you know, land theft uh, by the federal government. So it's, it's kind of, I don't get why, you know, why he would write a song and not be reflective about that. So, um, so anytime I hear that song, I, I, I can't hear it. I, I, I tune it out. I turn it off. And in fact, I'm, you know, have written about that in this new book that I'm working on about why it's such a problem for Native people. That was Dina Gilio Whitaker. We'll hear more from her later in the show. Today, we're discussing questions of access and privilege when it comes to America's public lands and natural spaces. When Jessica Newton tried inviting her daughter's friends on family hikes, many of their moms said no way. She realized that not all Black women were as comfortable out in nature as she was. She started an organization called Black Girls Hike that later became Vibe Tribe Adventures. They go zip lining, hiking, river rafting, and more. They're based in Denver with chapters around the United States and a few overseas. I've always been an outdoorsy girl. Black women, we're already very communal anyways. And so being able to say, hey, Black girls, let's go out and hike. Well, number one, it attracted women who were already outdoorsy. And then I started seeing other women who had never been outdoors. And it was like, hey, I saw you guys. You made a post on Facebook and I just want to try it. There are tons of black women across the globe who want to get outdoors, but they may not have the education on how to be outdoors. They may not have the resources to get outdoors. And there's a fear of wilderness. We did have an incident where we went hiking and the state patrol, park rangers, and the border directors were called on us for hiking. What they tried to say is that we didn't have a permit because there were so many of us, but we had no idea that there was gonna be this many out. And so the fear manifested itself. I saw people who are trying to explore outdoors and they already have a fear of wildlife. Now we have to worry about other human beings who don't necessarily think this is a place for us or a place to be diversified. Because Denver is not, you know, our percent for being African-American is about 2%, 2 to 5%. So typically our guides will go scout a trail to see how it feels out there. If we get the, you know, the look like, hey, what are you doing here? It's like, nah, this is not a good city. We're going to go to the next one. I do know that Colorado Parks and Wildlife is definitely, definitely trying. Taisha Adams, she's actually the first African-American commissioner for um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. You just look at the history on the wall. You just walk down the hall and you see poster, picture after picture after portrait after portrait. And there's no Native Americans, no Asians. Like, it's crazy. I'm like, wow, this is what Parks and Rex is made of. And so for me, it's a joy to see someone like her step into a position of action to say, here is where we change our policies, our legislative efforts. How do we work on getting the brown community, the black community outdoors and just really intricate into the outdoor atmosphere? That was Jessica Newton, founder of Vibe Tribe Adventures, an outdoor group for black women. You're listening to Climate One. Today, my guests are Dina Gilio Whitaker of California State University, San Marcos, Diane Regis of the Trust for Public Land, and Justin Farrell of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Diane Regis, your great-great-grandmother, I believe, came and homesteaded in what is now Denver, where you grew up. I'd like to hear your reflections on Jessica Newton and how certain people just don't feel welcome in the outdoors. Yeah, first of all, um, it's unfortunately all too common that people experience these kinds of incidents. And I love Jessica's leadership at bringing people together and getting outdoors. I think it demonstrates a couple of really important things. One is that it's not enough to just have the land and trails there. People have to feel welcome. And that is that requires everything from community leadership to leadership at the governmental level, um, to, work, to work from groups like us, frankly, because the conservation um, movement needs to change to address these issues of people who need to feel welcome outdoors. Um, and, and so I, I love that work. It's absolutely fantastic. But I think it, um, to me, the, the core of it is that community creating that she's doing. Um, and what we find is that centering around community 
whether it's in a, a black neighborhood, a Hispanic neighborhood, whether it's working with a tribe, um, that centering around community is where you create that power and create that welcoming atmosphere and people really begin to sense that they own these public lands. They have a right to be there. Dina, uh, white people often look at land as something to be developed or improved, something to to own. Uh, you know, parks are a little bit different. They're held in common. Um, tell us about how, you know, the Native Americans view land obviously very differently, not something to be shared and stewarded. We hear about seventh generation. Tell us about that conceptual difference in connection to the land. Yeah, we have this word. Okay, I'm going to throw out a, a jargony word here, and the word is called epistemology. And it's an academic term, and and it just simply means um, how we come to know what we know. So it's like knowledge, and we talk about indigenous epistemologies as or worldviews. We could say worldviews as very different than the Eurocentric worldviews that we are raised within. Um, that views land as uh, as anthropocentric, right, where that is uh, human-centered, that that is in service to humans, that is um, ultimately commodified. And thus we have, you know, you know, capitalism mediates um, these extractive industries that we know of, you know, with like with the oil and gas industry, with mining and um, the ways that we use the land to, um, to create wealth. But from an indigenous perspective, the land is a relation and all the things on the land is our relatives. We talk about our non-human relatives. So this is a worldview that is relational, um, that decenters humans. And it also decenters a discourse or a narrative of rights. And that's another thing about the Eurocentric, a Eurocentric worldview in uh, an individualist democracy, you know, quote unquote democracy, like we have in the U.S., um, that is what we call a rights-based society. In Native societies, they are responsibility-based societies because when you see the natural world and all the things in it as relations, as relatives, you are then responsible to them. So that sets up an entirely different kind of way that you engage with the land. Diane Regas, Trust for Public Land puts people at the center, which is different than some environmental organizations, which are some of them are focused on uh, saving cute furry creatures or, or whole ecosystems. Is, is Trust for Public Land anthropocentric? Is it human centered? And are other are the humans above more important than other members of an ecosystem? Oh, Craig, I think that's a first of all a really good question. I think there's a lot of commonality between the. Um, ideas that Dina is describing and what we're aiming for. We believe that communities need to be at the center. And if you think historically in this country about the phases of the environmental and conservation movements, you know, we created the national parks. That's wonderful. And it's uh, work that needs to continue to conserve places. Um, and then we had, uh, I would say, I would probably mark it with um, uh, silent spring where we started to really be worried about the chemicals and we had the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, um, a lot of those pollution oriented that was really about trying to control human behavior. Um, and in the 80s, we kind of added to that and said, you know, corporations also have to take responsibility. Um, but I, I believe that conservation needs to shift back to more of a focus on the relationship with people. And people at the center of our work means that we're thinking about the relationship between people and land, people in close to home parks, people in faraway parks, um, and what that means for the community. And to me, that's the next step for conservation is to really be bringing people and those relationships back in and recognize we are not gonna solve climate change. We are not gonna solve widespread species extinctions unless we really take into account people and communities. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. We're talking about preserving and protecting the great outdoors. My guests are Diane Regas of the Trust for Public Land, Justin Farrell, author of Billionaire Wilderness, The Ultra Wealthy and the Remaking of the American West, and Dina Gilio Whitaker, author of As Long as Grass Grows, The Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice, From Colonization to Standing Rock. 
In his book, Billionaire Wilderness, Justin Farrell explores the lives of the ultra-wealthy living on ranches and in gated communities in Jackson, Wyoming, near the majesty of the Grand Tetons. Like many, they're drawn to that state's pristine beauty and are dedicated to preserving its natural wonders. But there's a deep irony here. Wyoming is the largest producer of coal and um, you know, substantial oil, natural gas. And that, in a, in a lot of ways, has made possible this, what I call a tax haven in Wyoming. And it is very lucrative um, to move there for at least part of the year. They have very loose restrictions on what counts as being a resident. And so you, you see over time this rush of wealth to that corner of the state. Um, and for example, by 2015, eight out of every $10 made in Teton County came from investment dividends and it just interest um, rather than a salary from a job. And so um, the state is, is able to um, continue not to have an, an in, a state income tax, a corporate tax. And so it's a very uh, lucrative place. And you do, you know, you connect that to climate change. And I would ask them about, you know, maybe they worked in finance um, or maybe they worked for an oil and gas company or, you know, were CEO of an oil and gas company. And a lot of the conversations that we would have would kind of move away from these, these issues that I call buzzkill issues um, or issues that might um, place one in more choppier political waters um, because climate change is inherently, uh, you know, a political issue and um, is going to be resolved at, the, at that level. Um, and so, you know, it was really interesting to me to, under, to understand and to write about how they kind of navigate all of that in terms of they love the area, they love the pristine ecosystem, and, and yet climate change is wreaking havoc on that very ecosystem. So it was just difficult for them to kind of even conceptualize and discuss too. Coming from a different perspective, Dina Gilio Whitaker explores how indigenous knowledge can help move away from oil and gas extraction. Climate change, well, and not just climate change, but really um, the world that we live in that has led to this state of profound environmental degradation is the result of and is a problem of not just science, not just capitalism even, well, capitalism is a huge problem It's part of it, but it's, it's a problem of philosophy. Um, so it, and, and that worldview and that orientation that we have to the world, if we inhabit an orientation to the world that just is, it results in ext- this extractive relationship to the earth, then that's going to just keep perpetuating these, these environmental problems that we keep intensifying But if we change the way that we relate to the world, if we understand the land and the ecosystems and the the fundamental limitations of them and learn to respect those limits and our relations within them, then it changes the the kinds of decisions that we make about how we use the land. So um, I think that that's really the, the, the keys of indigenous knowledge. Um, because as indigenous peoples, I mean, when you live on the land and for thousands and thousands of years, as our ancestors did, that is the very definition of sustainability, um, land tenure um, and longevity on land without having destroyed your environment means that you you fundamentally understand what sustainability is and you live it. So um, that's why. Uh, In this country, indigenous people need to be listened to, we need to be paid attention to, and and engaged at all levels of decision making. Justin Farrell, you write about the charitable industrial complex and kind of the new Rockefeller paradigm. So, you know, where is that paradigm? Is that human-centered? Is that kind of preserving pretty landscapes for for a relative few? Explain what what the charitable industrial complex is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I also want to connect that with what Dina and Diane were saying, too. And I think with this, the charitable industrial complex, as, as I describe it, is built upon some of the myths, especially that Dina was mentioning, in how we how we see nature and how we use nature. And to Dina's earlier point about indigenous people being locked in time. And oftentimes, the preservation of nature um, especially in the area that I, that I wrote about, you know, it works differently in different areas, which we can talk about that. But out in, in the, especially in Wyoming in the West, around Yellowstone, Grand Teton National Park, the 
idea of nature and the idea of giving money and, and engaging in, you know, giving your time and philanthropy um, to protect nature is through this elite sort of white lens um, that can be based on, you know, this romanticized view of nature and a nature that, um, for example, for Yellowstone had to remove certain people um, to create that Eden and to create that um, mentality and that romantic idea that is still kind of beneath some of the organizations who work in these areas. But the charitable industrial complex I refer to um, just as this short-term phrase uh, in, in this area that describes you know, how folks give their money, who they give their money to. And oftentimes it, it goes to these issues that are um, serving themselves or serving their, their view shed or in some instances, improving their um, property value. And in the community of Jackson and Teton County, um, you have, it's the wealthiest county per capita in the nation, but also has the largest gap between the rich and the poor there. And so you do have a lot of social problems. Um, you have some homelessness in the schools um, and there are a lot of issues that need attention. And the money, um, as I show in one of the chapters of the book, is not going to any of those social services organizations who really need it. Uh, most of it is going to environmental and arts organizations who have you know, tens of millions of dollars in the coffers. Meanwhile, the people who you know, work for um, the wealthy who are there to enjoy this idea of nature um, are struggling, working two to three jobs. And so highlighting that disconnect between um, caring for the people and to Diane's point, what do we want our communities to look like? Um, and, you know, ones that are, that are more democratic that are sh or the ones that are shaped by a wealthy few. And so that's all kind of part of this, this makeup in the community and, and philanthropy uh, plays a huge role in that. Um, and also does a lot of good in the community, but I kind of highlight some areas where folks are more concerned about environmental issues that serve themselves or, or, or serve their elite experience of nature. Um, rather than a more holistic approach. Greg, if I could, if I could just jump in a second on that, because I think it's a really complex uh, point and one that's worth giving a lot of thought to. I mean, I would agree that uh, people who've got wealth can and should do more, but I, I don't want to lose sight of the reality that access to nature is actually essential for all humans. And if you look at the data, they show absolutely clearly a couple of things. One is having access to nature has a bigger impact on health, the lower income people are. So if you're high income and you've got, you know, all the other needs of life and a lot and, and a lot of the wants, access to nature actually does help your health. But if you're at a lower income, it helps your health more. So we believe that access to nature is essential um, and don't want to lose sight of that. Um, the other thing is, is and I, I found this statistic quite shocking um, when I first came to the Trust for Public Land, when I learned that 100 million people in this country, and that's 28 million kids, do not have a park close to home, do not have a green space close to home that they can access. And at the Trust for Public Land, we're actually about closing that gap because we know we all need access to nature. I think it's needed to solve the big problems facing the world, as well as to address the public health um, and community issues that we see now more than ever. Diane Regis, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about land use post-COVID. You know, there's a huge housing shortage, a lot of places. Now, maybe that'll change as people move away from urban centers and they can do their job remotely. But that's affordability crisis in a lot of uh, not just U.S. cities around the world. And that a lot of that gets to some of that is conserving land where housing can't be built. So how do you see, you know, coming out of COVID, um, if people are going to move, already moving out of, uh, the moving away from the coast, moving away from urban areas, that's going to put some development pressure on less populated areas. How do you see that playing out? You know, it's interesting. There was already um, pressure on some of those more small to mid-sized cities. I think about Bozeman, Montana, or Gunnison, Colorado, places that are beautiful, have access to public land on trails. People are able to work more remotely. And of course, that's been accelerated under COVID. I think that that commitment to equity that we need the conservation and environmental movement to 
you know, built deeply built into everything we do brings a new set of challenges. Um, and the especially these issues, the issues of housing, which you, know, you need a piece of land to build a house on. Um, you need a piece of land to build an apartment on. You need a piece of land to, to live on. And I think there are some good examples around the country of how to begin to navigate that. And um, in in Gunnison, which I mentioned, you know, we were able to help with a land swap that created some trails and access for people, but also ended up with a big contribution of millions of dollars to create hundreds of units of housing in, in the Gunnison area. Same thing in Bozeman, Montana, where someone had evicted low-income people from, from their homes to do a new big development that went bankrupt. We were given the piece of land to build a central park for Bozeman, which is a wonderful thing to do and engaged lots and lots of hundreds and thousands of people in what that should look like. But there's a responsibility there to think about what about that housing shortage. And so there's interesting new solutions. Like in that case, we carved off um, a few acres to create housing in addition to having the central park. What I'm seeing is more and more partnerships that cross some of these traditional issue lines, like an environmental group or a conservation group also cares about housing, also cares about equity, also cares about public engagement voting. Um, and you know, we can get to that by really thoughtful partnerships with local communities, with um, whether it's a rural community, whether it's an urban community, whether it's a small city or town. You know, if you've ever gone for a vacation in a small town, a lot of times there's nowhere to get outside. And so there these issues that, that we're grappling with, whether it's housing, whether it's equity, whether it's um, access to the outdoors, you know, they show up differently in every community in our country. And we need to be very flexible and, and bring in allies to, to work on them. Diane Regas, you've also written about how uh, public spaces and public parks have been used as, um, you know, gathering spaces. You put out a statement about Lafayette Square in front of the White House and noted it's been used as an encampment for soldiers, the sites of duels, the longest running anti-war protests in the U.S., as well as a slave market and a zoo. That was new to me. Um, and our parks are, you know, public forums where we can gather, celebrate, protest and mourn. So talk to us about the, you know, the importance of public spaces, especially now. If you think about um, what has happened in our lifetimes and where people go when they're feeling a need to gather, when they're responding to challenges facing our country, we go to public spaces. Um, I lived in Washington after 9-11, and I know we all flocked to public spaces to gather and mourn. But that's true at uh, you know, big historic events. It's also true in communities when you get together for a picnic at a social distance now, um, or a community comes together for a market or a parade or a community meeting to really imagine and create what they want their community to look like. Oftentimes it's in parks and public spaces. So public spaces play such enormously important roles. They help define culture. Um, they help define community and create community. So we're we, that's why we put community at the center, and we think it's so important to uh, look at the data and make sure that everybody is actually getting access to these spaces. Justin Farrell, you testified before Congress about dark funding of climate misinformation and the connection with philanthropy. So there's sort of a dark side. I'm curious if any of the people you interviewed are you know, funding climate denial organizations while preserving the you know, trout streams in Wyoming, but funding climate denialism. Did you get into the, any of that? Yeah, I would say I'm, I'm sure there's overlap within those networks because a lot of it runs within some of these conservative think tanks that do all sorts of work, not just um, you know climate denial. And actually, uh, most of that has went underground in recent years. So during the 90s and early 2000s, um, you had you know Exxon funding a lot of these groups or even creating imitation environmental groups to um, disparage the facts on climate change and to spread misinformation. And so that testimony um, before the Senate committee was about that process and that the history of fossil fuel companies and their allies um, to essentially confuse the, the American public on climate change. And so, you know, there's some commonalities between my new book and that, but 
that's the, the fossil fuel funding of climate denial is much more nefarious, um, much less complex in its motivations. And um, whereas in this, this book, there are a lot of really interesting ironies and complexities, and there's a lot of goodwill even that just kind of falls flat sometimes. Um, whereas in you know climate denial, it was uh, they had the mission and they they mostly accomplished it. Dina Julia Whitaker, you live on the California coast, where the term managed retreat uh, is sometimes used. You say that's rich people's territory. There's a lot of wealthy coastal property that's at risk. You know, how do you see that that playing out? Well, uh, the way I see it playing out is that sea level rise doesn't discriminate, and so uh, you know on these uh, these coast with these coastal properties that are by and large owned by wealthy people um, who will not be able to get flood insurance who still who cannot get flood insurance um, they are facing you know massive amounts of uh, stranded assets um, which means that as we play that game as we talked about before that game of musical chairs somebody eventually is going to the music's going to stop and they're going to be holding property that is for all intents and purposes is um, worthless uh, because it's going to be underwater. So the state has taken that, that approach. Um, the Cal- Cal- state of California considers it a crisis now, and that's how they're dealing with it. And um, the, the fights around armoring and managed retreats are heating up. And, uh, and at the same time, it's also in raising these questions about access and um, how do we protect access to public spaces um, to the coast for public people or people in the public and people who come from disadvantaged communities that don't have easy access to the coast. And so um, this is the work of the Coastal Commission, some of the great recent work of the Coastal Commission that uh, you know I applaud. And uh, having done this work of uh, creating an uh, environmental justice policy and um, engaging tribes. We've been talking about wealth, privilege, and how that relates to American wilderness. My guests today were Justin Farrell, Associate Professor of Sociology at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, Diane Regas, President and CEO of the Trust for Public Land, and Dina Gilia Whitaker, American Indian Studies Lecturer at California State University, San Marcos. To hear more Climate One conversations, subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help advance the climate conversation. Sarah Catherine Coxon and Brad Marshland are our senior producers. Our producers are Ariana Brocious and Tyler Reed. Kelly Pennington directs our audience engagement. Steve Fox is director of advancement. This episode was edited by Ariana Brocious and Devin Strolovich and engineered by Arnav Gupta. Dr. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. 